Hi, I'm Paul Marcel. So I want to continue on the no comment build, which actually I should really call it the Tim Burton table. A friend of mine labeled it that, and I can't think of a better name for it than the Tim Burton table. So continuing on with the top of the Tim Burton table, I wanted to describe how, how that part was sort of sculpted, built, and, and everything. Now the top, I definitely did not want something, you know, designed out of like using a pantograph, making this perfect oval or anything like that. So I ended up using, you know, cardboard. Now the cardboard itself is, you know, it's a pretty, it's not very accurate, <laughs> but that in a way was something I really wanted to accentuate in this project was the whole fact that, you know, you don't need to use precision at every single step of the way. So there were a lot of things here that weren't all that precise until a lot later in the project. In many projects, you can do something with a whole lot less accuracy up front. It makes it a lot easier to deal with, a lot less stress and all that if you postpone the part where you kind of apply the accuracy a little bit later. So I was trying to accent that and highlight that in this project as well. So now with the cardboard being used as, as a simple pattern, as you saw when I was laying it out, I did use you know a tape measure, so I was doing some measuring, but mostly what that was for was to set the depth of this table. I wanted it to be at least 12 inches deep, and I also wanted the width of the table from one end to the other. You know, I was looking at around 30, I, I wanted it to be at least 36, I've got it at 37. So what I did on the cardboard when I folded that out is I simply made some marks to say, here's a minimum mark for the depth and a minimum mark for the half dimension. And then from there, it was just a simple matter of you know, doing kind of an arc with my hand, something that looked kind of nice. Now, in my case, what I was doing is I was doing a quarter of you know, a full oval because of the way that we can take advantage of a mirroring effect. So by designing this quarter, I can take this and I can mirror image it to the other side. It makes it a lot nicer that you're gonna get some consistency here as opposed to if you tried doing that whole thing by hand. So after I drew the quarter oval for doing this, this pattern, one of the things that you saw me doing was I was taking this and I was kind of going to the outside perimeter of it measuring. Now what I was measuring is I was trying to make it that these outside pie, the outside sides of these wedges here were all approximately the same width, approximately. They don't have to be you know super exact, but I wanted them to look kind of correct. Now you could always design a table like this where you're actually intentionally making them random. I think that would look bad if they were completely random, but you could do a progression, right? You could make something that's narrow here and it gets wider as it gets to the middle, or maybe narrow in the center and they get wider to the outside, something like that. Those type of progressions could look really interesting. So those are other ideas that you can throw into the design box. Now here, the reason why I was doing the measuring is because of the width of the boards. Now here's one of the other boards that I had stacked up when I showed you the full uh, range of boards that I was selecting from. So what I did when I was doing this is I simply took a measure and it's like, okay, it's eight and a half inches. So let's go for uh, about like seven to eight inches, somewhere in there as a consistent size. So I ended up shooting for, let me verify, eight inches. <laughs> I thought it was eight, but I wanted to make sure. So eight inches is what I was going for for this outside dimension. Now this one here on the outside edge is less because I didn't want a full eight here. I wanted to make it look like it had been cut, like it was cut from a full size table. And also this middle one is a half size. So this is only gonna be four across simply because this one here is gonna get mirrored to the other side because I wanted a single wedge here in the middle. One of the things I did not wanna have is a panel joint right here because people are tending to be in the middle of it. And if this panel joint is coming out right at them, no matter how clean you make that panel joint, it's still gonna stand out a little bit more than any of the other ones. So I went for keeping that as a single wedge here. So that was the measuring that I was doing. It was mostly to make sure that I would be able to make the wedges out of the stock that I had. Now, of course, with the size of these wedges being considerably different, yet the outside edge having the same sort of uh, tangential distance on it, well, turns out the angles are all different, but we don't really care because we're just gonna take it over to the track saw after we draw the lines and we're just gonna drop the track right onto the line and cut it. We don't care what the angle is gonna be. So that's one of the beauties of a track saw is something like this is so easy to do with the track saw. Whereas if you're doing it with a table saw, you gotta do a lot more work to get that thing angled and lined up properly. Now when I was lining up the wedges onto the stock, one of the things that you noticed was that 
I was lining up the boards, I would put the triangles on here like this. I wasn't trying to jam as many of them as I possibly could to a width because what I wanted is I wanted the grain to be going straight down the middle of the wedge. So that makes it look a lot nicer that way as opposed to having kind of a skew grain everywhere. You want to make it look like it's radiating out from the back center. So that's something to keep in mind. Now the problem with that, of course, is that it ends up making for some really weird offcuts. In my case, I was going to be using those offcuts for creating the octagon piece. Now this is one of the boards that I got from Bob Close. I usually get cherry from him because he's got some really nice stuff and I don't get to find curly cherry like this out here anyway. But, you know, I live in a desert. So unless I want to build something with nopales, I'm pretty much set to having to order it online. Now in the case of cherry, the curly cherry, the curl is going to be closer to the outside edge of the tree. I mean, it all has to do with like the tree being bent back and forth as it's growing with, you know, wind and things like that going on. It ends up causing all the grain to get interlocked and moved around. And that's what gives you the nice curl that we're all after. Now the closer you get to the outside edge of the tree, the more of the sapwood you're going to start to get into the picture. If we take a look at this, this board here also came from the same tree, but it is from much further inside the tree. And you can see that it's all heartwood. It's also a lot less interesting. So there's hardly any curl at all in here. It's very nice grain. It's pretty nice and straight. But if I were to have cut wedges out of both of these pieces, it would definitely show in the pattern up top that there would be a loss of curl in some, and it would just really draw your eye to that as a defect, not as something that you really want to see. So it's something to keep in mind. And another thing to keep in mind is that in the case of cherry, sapwood is not considered a defect, unlike some of the other woods like walnut. But the problem with sapwood in the case of cherry is that cherry is going to darken. So this, these are some older scraps of wood that I had in my scrap bin, and these are cherry that have been you know, sitting around for a while. You can see how much darker this is compared to the stock that I have here. And even this is darker than when I originally received it. But the sapwood is not going to darken. So after a while, you're going to have this type of a contrast going. And that would look terrible on the table. And there were actually some bits of sapwood in the table as I put it together. But it didn't really matter to me because I knew I would have to do some equalizing and then coloring of the table. So that actually eliminates the problem with the sapwood. But we'll discuss that in a lot more detail once we get to the finishing episode. So now one thing to remember is because of the way that we created just a quarter pattern here to create this half and we're going to mirror image this is that when you mirror image you're flipping all the boards. I have to remember to flip it over when I'm making the marks in order to create the correct orientation for that board. If you forget to do that it's not all lost because of course the board that you cut over here you could just flip it over and it'll be in the correct orientation. The problem would be is that one of them would have this much curl and then the other one you'd be flipping over and you'd get this much curl. But it would really be bad if this half of the table had less curl than this half of the table. So it's important to try keeping that in mind and you only make that mistake once. So we use the track saw to cut all these wedges out. There are a couple things that are of interest to note when you're cutting out these wedges. Now this is one of the off cuts that I had uh, from some of the earlier pieces of the, the octagon. And the grain is flowing straight down the center of this board, yet I had to cut it at an angle, much like these wedges. This grain here is basically all end grain. Now it isn't quite as bad of an end grain as say up here, but it is still a lot of end grain. So when I was applying glue to the wedges, I had to apply them on both and then go back a couple minutes later and apply more because it basically just all absorbed. So it's a very much so all these wedges being glued together like this in the way that I did it for this table it's all end grain being glued together. So it tends to be an inherently weaker joint than say long grain to long grain, like this edge to another edge that was all long grain. So we have to do something to strengthen that. And the way that I did that is I was using the domino. Now when I'm placing the dominoes on here, I have to be conscious of the idea that I'm gonna be shaping all the underside here and cutting it away. So I really don't want a domino you know, in the middle, somewhere where when I'm scooping away doing the shaping, I'm suddenly going to reveal it. That would be horrible in a project like this. So when I place the dominoes, I place them as close to the surface as I possibly could, giving myself a little bit of room so that I could do some sanding on the top. And also, you don't want it so close to the top that they could, you know, pop through if there was some force put on there, because they are the strength in this case. So I did end up placing the dominoes close to the surface, 
but also they were mostly only towards the inside radius. So if we cut a small radius here on the table, that's mostly where I kept the dominoes because I knew I was going to be tapering this to get thinner and I didn't want to have to deal with the fact that, you know, where's that domino and, you know, is the next pass of the sander going to reveal it. So now clamping these things gets really tricky because you've got basically something that looks like a V and you're trying to put the clamps on this thing. So it's just like a watermelon seed. You take something like this and you start putting some pressure on here and it just wants to squeeze its way straight out. So the way that I ended up doing it is, you know, I created a simple clamping call. I used those on either side of the wedge so that I could present flat surfaces for the clamps to pull against. So when the clamps were pulling, they were pulling, putting the force straight across the joint the way I wanted them. Uh, but of course, the problem is that that clamp is wanting to squeeze like a watermelon seed, the wedge straight out the top. So that's the reason why I put a pair of dogs at the top. And then I also placed a pair of dogs at the bottom so that the clamps would, you know, the clamps are trying to slide down and the wedges are trying to slide up. So this way here, neither one of them could move and I could just put the clamps on there and keep them all still. Now, after cutting the wedges with the track saw, the one thing I did is I, I went and I took an edging plane in order to clean up the edges for the machine marks. Now, generally, you don't get a lot of machine marks when you're using like the track saw against a board like that, especially with the rail. However, when you're cutting it on an angle like this, remember that you're doing a lot of cuts that are cross cuts in this case here, and you're kind of close to the grain, but you're kind of cross cutting. So part of the problem will be is if you were to look at this board this way here, is if I was cutting the saw this direction here, I'm basically going into the grain and it's going to kind of lift it a little bit. Whereas if instead I was cutting this direction, I'd be cutting across the grain, but I wouldn't be trying to lift any of it. So it's, it's very much like you're taking a hand plane and you're trying to cut with the grain or against it. If you had a tapered leg, there's a proper direction for hand planing it and an improper direction. It's the same thing with the track saw. It does make a bit of a difference. You'll be able to really feel it when you touch the surface. So one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that those surfaces were dead smooth. So I used just the, this uh, edging plane from Veritas is really nice in that it's already got the 90 degree on there. So you just push it on there and give it a couple quick swipes and it can eliminate any of the machine marks and also kind of clean up the surface to make it really smooth. So you'll get a better glue up. Now, normally when you're doing a panel, uh, you're going, you know, right next parallel to the grain, the cut right off the track saw is perfectly clean for that. And actually, even in this case here, you probably could glue up all the wedges and be fine. The one reason I wanted to be careful about it though and make sure that those edges were really clean before glue up is because they could look fantastic when I first glue them up. And then I take the sander and I start doing all the shaping and then I might reveal a part in the middle where, you know, maybe it was bowed like this, you know, the two surfaces that were joined together. So there actually is a gap that I'll be revealing. Each one of these scallops, of course, is kind of, kind of following the wedge. I mostly went down the center of a wedge for each one of the parts that I scooped out with the router. Now, of course, they don't want to scoop out as much near where this column was going to be, where the octagon was going to be, but you wanted more out here at the edge. So what I did is I created a set of ramps. Now these are just, you know, kind of arbitrary that I wanted them to go a certain distance down. I know the general distance that I needed to go from the center to the outside edge and how much more or how much little I wanted to be able to take off. So let me put this in the correct orientation. So with this, you can see that here, the bit would be as far down as possible. Whereas up here, it would be probably even skating the surface. And that's actually what I did is I set the bit depth so that when I had the router up here, it was just barely touching the wood, if at all. Whereas down here, of course, it would pull out more. So what this was for was this was, if you've watched the series I had on my uh, sculpted mahogany vanity, I called this kind of pre-sculpting. So it was a way of hogging off just vast amounts of material pretty quickly. But the other big benefit of it was that it set the depth of these scallops. All of them were set very consistently by the router. So now, sure, I can do some shaping and there'll be some minor deviations, but for the most part, I'm already really into the ballpark with the right depth. Now, the bit that I used for that was this dish carving bit. So it's, it's basically flat on the bottom and then it has a rounded edge that goes straight up. So it's nice that on the outside edges, I had something curving up. So all I did is I used some double stick turners tape on the bottom of this and then just stuck it to the stock. 
in the different places. You can see that for the most part, all I did is I used the wedge where the joints were located. That's where I put one of these boards. And the dust collection is gonna suffer greatly when you've got a bit projecting out really far and nothing to capture the dust, which is why you saw so many chips flying off the side. Now, admittedly though, I didn't uh, wake up with you know cherry boogers, so I'm pretty sure that a lot of the fines were getting picked up by the vac, so I was very happy about that. So try this out, grab some two by fours, you know, and just give them a, a ramp like this, stick them on some stock of some kind that you're playing with, maybe some scrap out of your bin, and you can really do some interesting effects like that. Now that does bring up the question of why did I spray it with water and then wrap it all up and then leave it? The reason why is whenever you're taking a board and you take a large amount of wood off of just one side, you're exposing a different moisture gradient. You've, you've shifted the gradient. Now the outside surface of this one side is either significantly drier or significantly wetter than the other side. So it's gonna bend one way or the other because of that. Now to counter that, what I wanna kind of do is I wanna rehydrate both sides so that they're gonna absorb as much water as they want. And then I wanna let it sit there and kind of dry again. So you're trying to redry it quickly so that everything is back to balance. Now this is something that Charles Neal does routinely and I picked this up from him and I've had excellent success with that. So what I did, I sprayed both sides heavily with some water, you know, and then as you're setting some things up, you let it sit there and soak in and then you wipe away the excess. I tented it up in just some black towels, uh, tried to keep things off of the surfaces so that they can not have you know, moisture held against them. But this way here, if one side evaporates some moisture, the humidity would stay in the bag. If the other side wanted to take in some moisture, it could do that. So by doing that, the whole panel stayed nice and flat. The next day, there was zero cupping I had to deal with at all on the panel. And of course, I was doing more shaping after that. And every time I would do uh, a significant amount of shaping, I would do that hydration trick. Then we moved on to one of my favorite shaping tools and that's the RAS. I know, who cares about a sander, but this one's fun to play with. Now I'm sure it's fun if you use it for stripping like most people do, but I like to shape with it, so that's what I'm doing with it. If you're intending on doing some shaping with the RAS, I would recommend just get some P36 and some P50, maybe a little bit of 80, but for the most part, 36 and 50 will get you a long, long way in doing some of the shaping. Now next up with the shaping, was the RO90. The RO90 was used for any of the grits above the 50 and some of the little bit of 80 that I used. So for the most part, I started doing work with this in and around 80. Now the benefit of the little sander is of course, I can more easily get into uh, the kind of tight radii that I have here and the transitions that go over the different humps. But one of the keys was using this interface pad. So let me just slap that on so it sticks. Uh, the interface pad making it a whole lot easier for it to go over the variances. Now lastly was cutting the back. By making this just a hair wider than I needed to so it went beyond 180 degrees, I could very easily look at it and line things up and go, that's where I want the back to be. And I just dropped the track saw on there and cut it off. Now one thing you might have noticed is that in the back there was some stock missing from one side. But what I did is I left it there so that when I would make this cut, there'd be this wedge missing back here. So now the other side happened to have some stock there. So all I did, I went ahead and I lopped that off as well. So this pulls away from the wall and I really liked the look of that. I, I was kind of wanting that. When I saw that the piece was missing and that I could do that, it immediately jumped out at me as a good thing to do. So that kind of concludes describing how the top panel was made. Normally a panel for a table is the most trivial thing to do. But in this case here, it was actually a lot of work because of the underside. Now, there's a lot of additional work to be done on this as far as how the dominoing worked with the octagon. But once we get through the octagon, then we're gonna talk about assembly and that's gonna talk all about that portion there as well. And then I'm gonna have an episode devoted to just all the finishing that was involved on here, especially all the color balancing. All right, next episode, we're gonna talk about creating this octagon and all the different goofy angles that were involved in that. So it's like a revisiting of my Angle Madness project.